decades, we've struggled to make our education equal and effective for all students. From desegregation to removing public prayer from our classrooms, schools have often been climates full of change. However, for the last 70 years, one thing has remained unchanged in our public schools, ability grouping. So today I'm going to um, kind of go through what ability grouping is, pros and cons, and then introduce an alternative that I think is a much better option. So first, um, let's go through what the intended goal of ability grouping was. So they hoped, original proponents hoped that by separating students into high and low achieving groups, they would be able to close that achievement gap that Nikki was talking about. As she said, it's not very um, doable to close during the higher education years, but this kind of was striving to do so. So they wanted to close that achievement gap and then they wanted to provide the optimal learning environment for all levels of achievers. Originally, I thought that this seemed like a noble cause and I thought that it might be very effective. However, by conducting my research, I've come to have a very different opinion of the practice. So today, I will emphasize three main things. First, ability grouping is severely flawed and it leads to vast inequalities in education. Second, the practice does not close the achievement gap. And third, a program that I'll introduce called AVID is a viable, although imperfect, alternative to ability grouping. So let's start with my first point. Ability grouping is severely flawed and produces vast inequalities in education. So as I've hinted, ability grouping is a very controversial process, and so I'm gonna run through kind of the argument in favor and opposed, and then hopefully you guys will see where I'm going with this. So first, one of the main arguments for those in favor of ability grouping is that it provides the specific tools that each level of student needs. For example, high achieving students will be given more stimulation and harder tasks, and low achieving students will be given more support. A second argument in favor of ability grouping is the idea that it would allow for differentiated instruction. This is when teachers are able to aim their lesson plans at one specific level of achiever. So they wouldn't have to worry about their lesson plan being too boring for those high achieving students or too challenging and quick for the low achieving students. Now I'll move to the case opposed to ability grouping. So one of the main problems and inequalities that results is there are vast discrepancies in the type of feedback received by the different ability groups. So a research by Rosenbaum indicates that the high achieving groups receive all of the praise and resources that a school has to offer. They are viewed upon very favorably by school administrators, officials, and teachers, and generally they get by very well. On the other hand, that low achieving group, they're seen far less favorably. They often end up being pitied by school officials and are given the resources that are left over from the high achieving groups. These different factors can have disastrous effects for the, for the low achieving group. Research by Gameron has found that students in these low achieving groups are far less likely to go to college than their high achieving peers. There are several reasons why this could occur. First, there's far less encouragement from teachers to do so. Second, there's a severe lack of peer role models for them to go to college. Typically, their fellow classmates in these classes aren't worried about taking the SATs and applying to college, things like that. Third, these students are usually, or not usually, but often pushed towards vocational tracks. And finally, unfortunately, these students are far more likely to drop out of school before they can graduate. Another inequality that results from ability grouping stems from teacher differences. So research by Oaks has found that teachers in high ability groups are highly qualified, and they teach in a way that promotes critical thinking in their students. They're very effective at engaging their students, and they really make a difference in their lives. On the other hand, teachers on the, for low ability groups, um, they very often rely on workbooks and don't promote critical thinking. So now we'll move on to my second point, which is that the practice does not close the achievement gap. So originally proponents thought that being in a homogenous setting would increase participation in, and achievement in these classrooms. So they thought that being around other smart kids would make smart kids push the envelope and achieve more. And being out of these kids' shadow would help the low achievers learn more. However, this was not the case. In light of all of this sort of conflicting evidence, one man, Robert Slavin, decided to take it all in and kind of come to one conclusion. So he conducted a meta-analysis, or what he called a best evidence synthesis, of 29 studies. He reviewed their findings, their methods, and came to one conclusion. Ability grouping has no discernible positive effect on achievement levels. 
no positive effect. In fact, it even has a negative effect on those low achievers. So if this is the case, if ability grouping is not fulfilling its intended purpose and is even harming at least half of our students, why do we continue with it? Can't there be a better way to do what we want to do? This brings me to my third point. I found a program called AVID, and I believe it is a viable, although imperfect, way to proceed with education. So what is AVID? The acronym stands for Advancement Via Individual Determination. It is a program that aims to make college a reality for all types of students. Their mission statement, as you can see on the board, is to close the achievement gap by preparing all students for college readiness and success in a global society. All students, not just those high achieving students that are emphasized in the ability grouping system. So that all sounds great, but how is AVID really different from ability grouping? First of all, it targets students that are often disadvantaged by the ability grouping system, those B, C, sometimes even D students that would be delegated to low achieving groups in ability grouping. Second, AVID is optional. Students aren't delegated to this track. In some schools they are, but vastly, AVID is optional. And third, skills like critical thinking and planning for the future are emphasized in AVID classrooms. If these kids were in their low achieving groups, they wouldn't get these kinds of skills. So you might be asking, how does AVID work? Their formula is rather simple. They raise the expectations they have of their students, and with the support system that AVID puts in place for them, they often rise to and far exceed the challenge that they are placed in front of. In other words, AVID functions under a philosophy of acceleration instead of remediation. So unlike being in a low achieving ability group classroom, these students aren't just coddled and given remedial help. In fact, students in AVID are required to enroll in at least one of the advanced classes that their school has to offer. This way, they are, they are given the opportunity to gain some of those skills that the high achieving students get. Another question that many people have is if it's easy to implement a model like AVID nationwide. The answer is a resounding yes. Since it was founded in 1980 by a high school English teacher in San Diego, the model has grown drastically. Today, it affects more than 700,000 students in almost 5,000 U.S. schools. Clearly, it can be implemented in various schools. However, as I said earlier, the model is not perfect. Over break, I got to talk to my high school English teacher who now teaches an avid English class. She had the following to say. I see both the good and the bad in the program. The support for the kids is definitely there, and they are challenged. However, it doesn't always work. I've got kids in my college prep English class that can't even construct a paragraph. That makes things hard. So in other words, these kids are being challenged, but it might be too late for them. To barely start taking these types of classes in high school poses barriers. So possibly starting programs like AVID at an earlier age could help relieve this problem. Regardless of these shortcomings, AVID has had vast success. For example, 98% of the seniors enrolled in AVID in the class of 2012 graduated on time with their class. Of that 98%, 90% were going on to college. In fact, 74% of AVID students go on to four-year colleges. Not technical schools, not community colleges, four-year universities. These rates far exceed their peers in low-achieving ability group classrooms. So in summary, I hope that you guys remember that ability grouping is severely flawed and produces vast inequalities. Ability grouping does not close the achievement gap. And AVID is a viable, although imperfect, alternative to ability grouping. So going back to my opening statements, we have shown in the past that we are capable of changing our schools for the betterment of our students. It's time to realize that that needs to happen with ability grouping. We need to explore other options and see what is best for our students. AVID is one option worth exploring. These kids are up to the challenge. The question is, are we? Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie.